Someday soon, my Savior will call out my Hi everybody, I hope you're ready for a Bible class tonight. Get your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. We're now into the part of the book of Acts where the Apostle Paul is the prevalent preacher. There's evidence that the 12 apostles, or the 11, one of them's dead, um, are still doing what they always did in Jerusalem, but the book of Acts has shifted its direction toward what the Apostle Paul is preaching. This actually started in chapter 13, verse 13, if you want to look that up. And it's the first time Paul had the prevalence uh, and the preeminence in the naming. It was Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas, and, and then it was Paul and Barnabas after that. Paul and his company, Paul and Barnabas, and so forth. And so there began to be the importance of Paul's ministry in the book of Acts. Here he is in Athens. And in Athens, he probably spoke to a bunch of people who had the foggiest idea what he was talking about. They thought he was pre presenting some new thing, some new principle, some new uh, philosophy or something. And so he's standing on Mars Hill and he's delivering a speech about God the Father, the creator of all things. And he gets around to mo um, moving them toward knowing who Jesus Christ is and they mocked him and left him go. But just before he finished this speech, he says, Of the Lord from heaven, God from heaven. He said, the one you're, you don't know, you got a, an inscription here to the unknown God. He said, I know him. I'm going to tell you all about him. I changed that just a little bit. But notice in verse 29, Paul says to this bunch of people in Athens, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. What I want you to see is that word, that phrase in the middle of that verse that says, but now. Now, the markings on the board are from the last Bible class we had. And I want to suggest to you that when Paul put the words, but now, into Scripture, he's referring to this time where I've got it marked. The Bible is a timeline. Here's the cross of Christ. Acts chapter 9 is when Paul was saved on the road to Damascus. And the but nows begin with the message that the Apostle Paul had. Okay? But now. He says, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. The word repent there is not weep over your sins. It's not even particularly repenting of your sins, although it's about idolatry in the context. So it's fine to repent of one's sins, but it's not about repentance, it's about understanding things in a different manner. The way they were understanding them was along the lines of the philosophies of men, not along the lines of the creation story, the call of God upon the lives of, of men like Abraham, or Noah and Abraham and Moses and on and on. No, that's not what they were doing. What they were doing was trying to make sense of the philosophies of the world, even if it took praying to a God they didn't know who it was. So when Paul looked over all the gods which they had named and saw an inscription to one they didn't know it was the unknown God, he said, I know him, because I don't pray to any of these you got, but I know the God of heaven and earth, God that created all things. God that made the world and all things therein. I mean, he gets specific with them. And so right here, he uses that word, but now. And if you take from here, forward in your Bible, going from the rest of the book of Acts, into Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Paul uses the phrase, but now, a total of 11 times. But there are, um, there are seven of them that are very, very particular to who we are and what we are once we believe the gospel of Christ for our salvation. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. We're going to quickly look at all of these if we can. Get through all seven of these here in this little short period of time. Romans chapter 3. All right, in Romans chapter 3, notice he says... Verse 9, 
What then are we, meaning Jews, better than they, meaning Gentiles? No, in no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth, there's none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Now look down, if you will, in verse 19. Now we know that what things serve of the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, in other words, the law said, Thou shalt, so if you did. And the law says, Thou shalt not, and what if you didn't? In other words, you didn't obey the law. What would it show you? Well, it's a truth. You didn't obey the law. It is a truth that you don't obey the law today. There are 16, 613 uh, commandments in the Mosaic law, and you don't know anyone who keeps the law. People say, well, I don't kill anybody. That's one. So I've never committed adultery. That's two. How are we doing so far? Two out of 613. Not bad. The book of James says that if you keep the whole law, the whole law, yet offend in one point you're guilty of all why because the death penalty for one is the same as it is for all the rest of them it's death you see the wages of sin is death so what did the law do showed your guilt the rest of verse 19 that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now watch this. This is great news. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Who was Paul preaching to? Anybody? He went specific places and he had a specific reason, but he preached to anyone who was there. Who could have gotten saved? Anybody. It was, uh, it was unto all, and it was upon all that believe. What's the difference? Well, it didn't used to be unto all. And it used to be more than simply believing. It used to be repent, be baptized, every one of you, um, uh, for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It used to be that if you believed that, you saved yourself from an untoward generation. It used to be that after you'd saved yourself from the untoward generation, what you did was you sold out everything that you had and you accompanied with the twelve apostles. That's what ch happened in Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, on and on. That's what was going on. We don't live like that. We never have lived like that. But now... Verse 22, the righteousness of God without the law. Verse, uh, uh, verse 21, I mean. Now to verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. That's his faith. By faith of Jesus Christ. So the but now of Romans chapter 3 is all about what Christ did. Praise the Lord. It's all about what Christ did for us. Christ went to that cross, paid the penalty for our sins. You hear the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, you believe it, you put your trust in it. And God Almighty will save you. That's what he said he'd do. That's the but now of our sinfulness. But now. Now notice the next one. Related to what we just read in Romans chapter 6. He says in, in earlier in the chapter, he says in verse... Um, Six, knowing this, that our old man, that be this flesh we're walking around in, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. Not ought to be, not should be, not we want it to be, not one day it will be. No, it is. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, 
But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Are you saved? Are you his? Are you in Jesus Christ our Lord? Have you reckoned yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God? Look over, if you will, in verse 22. But now, being made free from sin, an individual that's dead cannot sin anymore. <laughs> so you're dead. The flesh died. You're dead and your life is hid with Christ, the book of Colossians says. Think of that in a spiritual sense. I know you're listening to this program. You're walking around the living room. You're having a snack or whatever you're doing. Bless your soul. If you're in Christ, your flesh is dead because of sin. You can't help that. You can't change that. You can't fix that. You're always going to sin. So, there's a but now here. But now being made free from sin. If you're dead, if your flesh is dead because of sin, then God isn't holding your sins against you. Why? He had Christ pay for them. That's why. Look at chapter 7. Chapter 7. How did God handle this judicially? How did God handle this? He used a but now passage. Look at this. Verse 5. For when we were in the flesh... The motions of sins which were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of life, a newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the latter. Did you see that? Hmm. The newness of the spirit, by the way, is going to turn out to be the forgiveness of your sins and mine. That's a great news. Now notice, if you will, in chapter 16. We used this one last week, if you'll recall. Hope it didn't startle you much when I used it. Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. Here it is. You know why, how it's made manifest? We're reading about it. Right now, we're reading about it. Thirteen little books in the middle of the New Testament. Romans through Philemon. All about the but nows. Amazing, isn't it? Look, if you will, in Galatians chapter 4. This is all about people who got carried away with uh, maybe they'd made some kind of a mistake here and what if they were wrong and what if it didn't come out right and why, oh gosh, and just worry over things like that. But Paul reminds them that they were redeemed, that they've been adopted by the Lord and so forth. Notice he says in verse 6, And because you're sons, you're an adopted son to the Lord. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. If you've trusted Christ as your Savior, if you've believed that gospel and trusted Christ as your Savior, you're a son. Keep reading. How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods, but now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto you desire again to be in bondage? Did you not ever notice that today's church wants to put people in bondage as though they were putting them under some law? Churches that teach you must do this, you must do that, you must do this, the other thing. First you join the church, then you get on this committee, then you do whatever the preacher says to do. You trust the preacher for all the words that come out of his mouth. You better be trusting the word of God for what comes out of his mouth. And if he disagrees with the word of God, you don't need to trust him. I don't care who he is. I know that for a fact. I've pastored churches for 36 years. I'm not about to tell somebody to follow me. Please. Are you kidding he says, but now. I mean, you know this stuff is true. We've been reading this stuff to you out of the Bible all this time. And you want to turn to weak and beggarly elements? Do you know what weak and beggarly elements are? Religion. How do you know that? Keep reading. He says, but now after that, verse 9, but now after that you've known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again to the weak and beggarly elements where you, too, you desire again to be in bondage? You observe days and months and times and years. Well, we're in the middle of the season for observing days, starting in December all the way through that thing next month. 
at the, right at the end of March. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Observing days and months and times and years. Special days. Sacrament days. Holy days. On and on it goes. The but now said, how turn you again to these weak and beggarly elements? They're just weak and beggarly elements. That's all they are. Now look at Ephesians chapter 2. See, there was a time in the lives of all of us there's a time in the life of all of us when we didn't fit into God's plan. There's not ever been anyone raised Christian. Oh, you may have been raised in a Christian home. You may have learned all about Christian churches and Christianity. But you weren't raised a Christian. I'll tell you what you were raised as. You were raised as a sorry low down skunk sinner. Click. Did you turn me off? Come on, think about it. You know, good and well, you never did match up to God's righteousness, not in your entire life, let alone right, being raised a Christian. You know what I found out about most of us? I was one of them. You know what I found out about most of us who were raised Christian? We knew we were lost until the day we got saved. And we knew every time someone thought we were a Christian, we were being a hypocrite. And we knew one day, I can't stand that anymore. But now, I needed a but now, uh, last Thursday night of October 1964. I needed a, but, a big but now. Here's what I needed. Look in Ephesians 2. He says in verse 11, Wherefore, remember that you being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, you are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Many of you may be in that position right now. You're not attached to anything, not attached to anybody, and you have no, you're have you alienated from the life of God. Look at verse 13. i got great news for you. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make himself of twain one new man. And they might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you. Bless your soul. Romans chapter 5 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's great news. How about you? Do you have peace with God? There's a great big but now there that's all for you. But now in Christ Jesus... You've been made nigh by the blood of Christ. Isn't that a magnificent thing? Salvation is so great and it's eternal and you can never lose it. Never lose it. You know, usually when you do a broadcast, you get a response from somebody and you know, the first one is generally about talking about water baptism. I make people angry because I say we don't need water baptism. We don't. Then I make people mad by saying you can never lose your salvation because there's about a third, maybe 40% of all the Christian denominations that think you can. And that's because they're trying to go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and get some of their doctrine, go over to Paul and get some more of their doctrine, run over the book of Hebrews, James, and 1 Peter and get the rest of their doctrine. That won't work, folks. Go to what God wrote to you, Romans through Philemon. Look, if you will, in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1. And this is the last of those... Um, but now that we're going to look at. And this is great. Last week we talked about, we came full circle around to talking about, we went from the traditions of men and, and um, uh, the pharisaical position and on all that sort of thing. We came all the way around to what Paul said being mysteries and how he unfolded mysteries. Well, here is the capstone of all Scripture about what we have in Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, what we have in Christ is eternal life because of the gospel of the grace of God. 
He said in Acts chapter 20 that he was going to go to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He did it from jail in the books of Ephesians and Colossians profoundly. Salvation by grace was what Paul preached from the moment he preached the gospel of Christ. But when he preached the gospel of the grace of God, he was talking to lugheads like me and you. He's talking to you right here. Now he says here, verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in him, Jesus Christ, should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. Now I want you to consider being reconciled to God. God is not angry at you. Next week we're going to yes, next week we're going to talk about 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and and sort of a broader picture of it. But let me tell you something, a forerunner to next week. We are not we don't have a God who's angry at us. God is not going to get us. You know why? For every sin that anyone's ever committed or ever will commit, God got his son for it. God crucified his son on the behalf of every one of us willing to receive it. So he says he's made peace through the blood of his cross. That's the work that he did. And he said that included you, verse 21, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, that would be us. It's who we are. We are that by nature. Now notice, start down with me in verse 24, but we'll pick up the last line in verse 23. In conclusion to the, pre the presence of this gospel in our lives, he says, I, Paul, am made a minister who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Now watch. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest to his saints. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles which is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Now let me recap a couple of things. Here's the deal. Romans to Philemon is what Paul wrote and he wrote it to one group of people. It's called the church, the body of Christ. And it's for those of us who are today living in the grace dispensation. We are not living under the law of Moses. We're not back here under the law. We're not under the law that Jesus put the twelve apostles under, and he did. Read Matthew chapter 5 if you want to understand that. And it's very clear that they're... But, and this which they were under will be in effect over here. The law to Christ is over here. But here, in the but now section of this board, in the but now section, we're living in the grace dispensation. We're not under the law, but under grace. Romans 6.14 said that. But what we are in now, God is not angry at anybody. Instead, He has placed Christ in us, the hope of glory. And He said that it's because He had made manifest these great mysteries. To Paul, then to us, and to whoever we can get to see this. Folks, this is not strange. This is written down in Scripture. I want to remind you a couple of things about Scripture. Look, if you will, to 2 Timothy. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, he knows he's going to die. In the next chapter, he tells Timothy, the time of my departure is at hand. He knows he's fixing to die here. He's in prison, and he knows there's no, no possibility of, of getting out. Now notice what he says here to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He says in verse 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You know what that means? The deceivers don't even know that they themselves have been deceived while they're out there trying to deceive people. And he's not talking about the devil and nightclubs and honky tonks and getting drunk and taking dope and all. He's not talking about that. He's talking about religion. 
You think he's not? Read Romans to Philemon real carefully and you'll see that he is. Notice verse 14. But continue thou, he says to Timothy, called him my son in the faith. He says, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. We'll come back to that. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now I guarantee you that you've got more than Timothy had because Timothy was the recipient of this. We don't know what else Timothy knew, although we know he knew what Paul had written. But what else he knew from the New Testament, we don't know what Timothy knew. But Timothy had grown up with the Old Testament. His mother and grandmother had taught it to him. Now notice he says in verse 16 to Timothy, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now I want you to consider, we don't read a lot of Scripture in the Old Testament. We don't read a lot of Scripture on this program in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, although quite a bit from time to time. We don't read much Hebrews through Revelation. But we do read what Paul wrote. But he said that all Scripture is profitable. Well, then let it be. But that doesn't mean that you have to go back and try to figure out how to live under that. What's it for? Romans chapter 15 verse 4 said, Whatsoever things are written aforetime, and to you and I, that's everything from Genesis to Revelation. Whatsoever things are written aforetime are written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. That's Romans 15, 4. Now, back in verse 14, when he told him to continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, notice he says at the end of that, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Go back to chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. Hold fast the form of of sound words which thou hast heard of me. That's pretty explicit, isn't it? He tells Timothy that the form of sound words Timothy had heard from Paul himself. Notice he says in verse 14, That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which is dwelleth in us. Isn't that amazing? That good thing which was committed unto thee that would be the form of sound words of verse 13. It would be all Scripture, as Paul said. It would be all the things you learn from me. You think I'm wrong? Look in chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. And then there's two more def very defining verses here. Verse 7 says, Consider what I say. That's Paul. Why was Paul like that? Because Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, about 20 times you'll find that in Scripture. He says, Consider what I say, and the Lord give the understanding in all things. If you will first define yourself in Romans through Philemon, then you'll be able to find application in all scripture about you. Not that you follow all the doctrine. You couldn't possibly follow all the doctrine. Romans through Philemon carries your doctrine. So he says, remember, verse 8, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead before Paul ever started preaching. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead is what Peter was preaching. The twelve apostles were preaching. But Paul said it's according to my gospel. So what is that gospel? It's what we're going to end on. He says, how that Christ died for our sins. That is, he went to the cross for our offenses. And that he was buried. And that he was raised again. That is, for our justification. If, if Paul was raised for our justification, are you justified? God is not angry at you. If you will reconcile to God simply by putting your faith and trust in what Jesus Christ has done for you, then God, with joy, for the glory of His Son, He'll save you, give you eternal life. Will you believe on Him today?
Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. See you next week. Someday soon I'll be in heaven. Someday soon we